Welcome to Just Men, a life-changing program that resonates hope as well as encouragement. The program that gives you information and inspiration for the glory of God. I'm your host, Jeff Tate, and thank you for joining Just Men. On today's program, we have a very special program. We're actually gonna go behind the scene of our first men's conference, celebrating over 13 years of empowering men into their destiny. Our program has been successful and that has reached your heart and changing your lifestyle and your attitude about what it takes to be a true man of God. I tell you, when you watch this video, you're gonna be empowered by the conference speakers. We had an opening keynote speaker, we had a closing keynote speakers, we had an athletes panel discussion, we had a clergy panel discussion and young adults and musicians. I tell you, it was impactful and powerful. So without further ado, let's go behind the scene of our first men's conference titled, Reclaiming Your Identity. All right, Minister Ricky, the question to ask, why do you have a concern for people in inner city who once held you trapped and captive in darkness? That's a good question. I want to thank God for me being here to be able to sit here right now. You know, it's really a blessing because I just want to recall about what happened to me as a young brother growing up. And I loved sports, especially basketball. And I used to be out in the yard playing by myself. And I used to aim the basketball at this certain spot on the shed in the projects. And I could hit that spot and I could throw the ball behind my back and I could do a lot of tricks with the ball and a lot of things like that. But in the meantime, it was a lot of activities going on. And one of the guys that was the kingpin uh, out there where I stayed at, uh, later on he became the kingpin number one when he went to prison. But before that, uh, he let me look through some money one time. And he said, if I can find any $1 bills, $5 bills, 10s and 20s, that I can have all of them. So I was excited about it. And, put out his bankroll and gave it to him. I went to searching through it. And before I got finished, I noticed he was laughing a little bit. The reason why he was laughing because it wasn't number $100 bills. And what happened was I was fascinated over it and it captured me. So along the way, when he went to prison, the game fell in my hand. And I excluded myself from being more interested in sports and everything. So people would ask me what college was I going to go to, who was recruiting me, and I would say things like this, college, why would I go to college, take a chance on breaking my ankle when I'm getting the kind of money that I'm getting? And I was so out of control, I said, I have more $100 bills than Van Kemp have poking beans. <laughs> now, you know something had to be wrong with me. That's how the enemy grabbed a hold of me. So when I went to the point where in desperation, I got on the drugs, when God brought me out, to make a long story short. I was so grateful that I asked him, what could I do for him? And the thing is, is that a lot of people was following me, and I was blind. I went into the ditch, and everybody else that was following me went into the ditch. So he knew there was a lot of people still out there. So he told me, just go tell your friends how good I've been to you. And all I could think about, he knew I was thinking about my friends, so I went and told them, which I knew they was going to have a hard time. Because remember, you know, I was the one that was the supplier. I had taken over a community in my neighborhood, and um, I went on out there, obeyed him, didn't know nothing about the word of God or anything like that, but I knew about his power. So I went out there and told my friends about it, and I know they was like, what's wrong with him? Knowing good well how much I love, I was addicted to heroin. And heroin was one of the strongest drugs on the planet that I've experienced. And, uh, and I've done it for 20 years of my life. And I got to a point where I said I wasn't going to be able to get off of it. And I said, well, I'm going to use drugs for the rest of my life. But how many of you know the devil's a liar? Amen. 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 The devil's a liar. <laughs> and so I went on back out there, done what he asked me to do. And that was in 1992. 1993, I was still telling it. 1994, I'm still telling it. I want to use drugs because I'm more used to my past than I was what I was doing then. But I felt pretty good, and I kept telling it. 1995, I'm still telling it. 1996, 
I'm still telling it. 1997, I'm still telling it. And suddenly, he called me a little bit closer, called me into the ministry in 1998. Then I saw it in his words about the compassion that he had on me. And the reason why I go back out, Brother Tate, is this. Jesus said he was walking through the cities and villages, teaching and preaching in the kingdom of God and healing every kind of sickness that was among the people. But he said, but when he saw the multitude, he said he was moved with compassion on them. And it reminded me of the compassion that he had on me. I must have the compassion on the people that are still out there scattered, lost. And then I noticed that he said he turned to his disciples and told them to pray because the harvest truly is plentiful, but the labor was a few. And I noticed all the churches that I had visited and the churches that I was going to, I noticed that it seemed like they don't know what's going on on the outside or they don't care. I was trying to say maybe they don't know. I got to a point where I said, I believe they just don't care. And I just went on out there. I was just one of the few, man. And you know what? Uh, I have so much support now concerning where I came from. It was so hard for them people to believe that I changed because I was the leader. And being a leader sometimes, you know, doing unhealthy things, people will follow you. But I noticed something. My phone stopped ringing when I started doing the right thing. I said it stopped ringing, right? Felt kind of lonely. Because I was wondering, with all this unhealthy stuff that I was doing, the drugs that I was serving, if somebody OD'd off the drugs that I was serving, that would be the exact drug that somebody would want that was on heroin. And then here I am today. I have the strongest high in the world. The one that lasts 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And people are afraid of it. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So my job is, Brother Tate, and I close with this, is to make sure that I introduce them to this particular high. So I have a book coming out. And the name of the book is called Still High. The second question is for the whole panel. We'll start with you, Chris. All right. You ready for the second question? I, I hope so. All right. <laughs> man, you might have to stand up. You can run, too, if you man, want. I'm man, be, I'm going to be, I'm gonna be calm this time. Yeah, you, you can run if you I'm want. I'm going to be now. calm. All right. Here's the second question. It's for the whole panelists. Okay. In order to surrender and reflect the full image of Christ, we must let go of our attachment to the flesh mm -hmm. and the world. What was the biggest thing you had to overcome that the world approved, but God disapproved? I just think for me, I was just a very sel uh, selfish guy. I mean, it was all about me and all about mine and mine. And I think when Jesus broke me and crushed me, that's when I could really see what God wanted to do in my life. I mean, it's just. It's, it's just heartbreaking, and it hurts, but the good thing about it is, is we're never disqualified. You see, you see kind of how I kind of want to go a different way, and God wants to take me a different way, so I'm going to say it. You know, a lot of times we as men, we think we messed up so bad, we made the wrong choices, we did all these bad things, and we focus on the bad things, but the one thing I love about Jesus is he's always waiting for us to tell us that we're never disqualified. We're never disqualified. I know you asked that question, but it's like God is just prompting me to say this. You're, you're, you're showing it's you. like this. I remember one time I was playing baseball, and I'm still kind of an athlete. I can run and I can hit the ball. I ran the first, I ran the second, I ran the third, and I ran home. And once I slid home, there was an umpire that was in the back. And as in the front, you know there's a plate in the front. It was dirty, and he took his brush and he wiped the slate clean. See, the thing about it is, it's the same thing with Jesus. We're running in sin, but once we slide into the Father, that Jesus is standing behind and he take his blood and he wipes our slate completely clean. Mm. But the first thing I had to do was slide. Mm. You got to catch that. <laughs> that means I, gotta, I had to surrender. And once I surrender, say, God, I can't do this on my own. What he does is he takes his blush and he wipes my slate completely clean. But here's the good thing, part of, the good part about this is, is there was an umpire that was behind us, and he's the only person that can make the call. Mm. 
he's the only one he's the only one on the field that has the authority to make the call i don't care if somebody's outside telling you this and you're that it doesn't matter because they're not the umpire See, we, we have a heavenly father that we, we, when we surrender to his will, he's behind us and he's saying safe. Mm. <laughs> he's saying safe. So once I surrender and say, God, I can't do this on my own. Lord, I blew it. I made all these mistakes. He's saying, you're safe. I'm safe from all my insecurities. I'm safe from all my doubts. I'm safe from all my depression. I'm safe from all that mess. Why? Because I surrendered to the Father. Mm. It's about surrendering. He's not saying, get your stuff together. He's saying, you come to me and let me take care of your mess. So now I can turn your mess into a message. I don't even know why I'm going here. It's about, and, and the thing about it is, I don't have this thing all together. A lot of times we look at the, the, the guys that are speaking and thinking we got it all figured out. God is still dealing with me, man. I still got stuff in my life that he's got to clean out. But the one thing I do and the way I win the battle is this. <laughs> God, I can't do this. You got to help me. My situation looks so bad. But when I surrender to the Father, he says, safe. Mm, wow. Do you need me to repeat the question? <laughs> In order to surrender and reflect the full image of Christ, we must let go of our attachment to the flesh and the world. What was the biggest thing you had to overcome that the world approved, but God disapproved? Wow. Uh, the biggest thing? The biggest thing for me would, 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 would probably be the um, the pursuit of uh, of of status, the pursuit of wealth, the pursuit of of of, uh, of just a, a acquiring all you can, because we live in a culture and a society where 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 especially in America where that's what life is about. You know, you go to college to get a degree to to make money. And then you, and you, and you work, you get a house, you get a car, and you, you get this, you get jewelry, all this stuff. And so um, for so long, I, I had believed that. And, um, and, and status, you know, you, you want to climb the corporate ladder or you want to achieve greatness. And so, um, and so that, that was the, the, the biggest uh, thing that the world approved of that, that, that God had to rock my world about. And, I, and I'll never forget it. I, I went into the NFL thinking I was going to play 20 years like Jerry Rice or, or how many years you play, Chris? I played eight. Eight, or, I, I, or at least eight, or five, but, but I'll never forget it, man. I, I was leaving the, um, the, the, the Titans facility uh, right after this – is, this is right after my rookie season. We had just finished working out. And only a few times in my life had God actually uh, – where I could actually hear that, like, audible voice. Only a few times. I could count it on one hand. And then as I was leaving now, he said, uh, right in the parking lot, what would you do if I told you to leave all of this? And I stopped right there in my tracks and, and, and stood there maybe 10, 15 seconds. And, and, like, I could hear him just as clear as I just said it. And I said I would do it, not knowing that uh, about a year later he would actually require that of me. And it was crazy because this is what I was trying to achieve. This is what the world was telling me life is about. Like, this, come on, man, you, you done put all this time and effort and, 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 and that doesn't make any sense, and it didn't make any sense to me. Um, but uh, it, it's a long story. I know we don't got a lot of time, but uh, but the, the following year, like, that's what he was requiring of me. But then I looked at all of the money. I looked at all of the, the things I would be walking away from, and I struggled with it. And uh, I, went, I was with the Raiders, the Oakland Raiders, and uh, I got hurt first time and, and, and – since I've been playing football since I was a little kid, that I was had a serious injury, and so uh, I wasn't even supposed to be in Oakland. If I can just keep it real, I, I wasn't even supposed to go on the on the play, on the flight out there. I'm a, I'm gonna land this plane, as they said. Or on on my flight out there, I knew I wasn't supposed to be going. Uh, God had confirmed that over and over, and I, I just knew it, just knowing in my spirit. But I went out there anyway. Um, actually, on the plane, I wrote down all this stuff God was calling me to do on the plane. 
I got back home waiting on to hear if, if the Oakland was going to offer me a contract or not. I shared this stuff with my wife. She says, hold on. She went upstairs. She grabbed her notebook. God had showed her the same stuff the week before. You would think that's enough. They called with a contract. I said, I'm there. So I went disobedient. I got hurt not even a month out there um, toward my Achilles tenant. Uh, so now this is the first time in like a couple years where I didn't have anything to do but but rehab. And so God confirmed it again over that six months of rehab that that he was calling me out of football. I didn't understand it, but but I was beginning to uh, be content with, with and, and find peace in it. So I got better. This is right after the New York Giants won the Super Bowl in 2008. New York, New York Giants call. Um, they wanted me to come out, uh, sign me to the practice squad, no, no, no tryout, no, uh, nothing. And so I um, knew I wasn't supposed to be there. So finally, I was supposed to go there on a Thursday. That Tuesday, I finally woke up and surrendered, man, and said, God, I, I don't understand this, but I'm going to trust you. And, I, and even though um, this doesn't make any sense to me, I'm going to trust you. So I called my agent that Tuesday morning and, and said, tell New York I'm not coming. And that was uh, 2000, 2008. And so it's, it's been a, a journey ever since. And, and, and a journey I wouldn't trade for the world. And, and, and like I said, um, to answer your question, to wrap it up, I, I that was the, the the biggest thing, and still trying to overcome that. Just that idea of 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 uh, just just moving forward and, and and pursuing and getting all you can and 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 just doing all that stuff for self and for and for and for uh, you know for the the just to be able to take care of yourself, if that makes any sense. So. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. All right, Amen. Minister Waller, same question. Run that question again because I want to make sure everybody hear the question again so I can line up with it. All right. In order to surrender and reflect the full image of Christ, we must let go of our attachment to the flesh and the world. Yeah. What was the biggest thing that you had to overcome that the world approved but God disapproved? The biggest thing was trust in me that I had to give up because I was used to leading my own pathway. And in the game of hustling was a big part of my life. As I said earlier, when I went to God with the desire to change my life, he took care of his business. And it wasn't that I wanted to stop using heroin. I was faced with a prison sentence. And I had an option to go to a treatment center for 28 days or four years to prison. Which one do you think I'm going to take? <laughs> <laughs> so I wasn't going down there for the 28 days because I wanted to go. I went because I'm trying to dodge the four years. Okay, so I done that and got down there and found out that I had a choice. I got upset and everything. So anyway, I still sell drugs. At that point in time, I'm still selling drugs. I went on to the treatment center, got out. I was still selling drugs then, but I wasn't using drugs because I found the answer. God was working with me. And then those few years went by, and I was wondering, why am I still selling drugs when I'm not doing drugs? And God, you the one got me off these drugs. I know that, but I'm still selling what I found out about God, the word of God said the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. So he wasn't worried about me selling drugs. He just wanted to show me what he was made of. And he knew that I love drugs. And these drugs are in my hand every day. And I couldn't even do them. Wow. Went to him. He delivered me again in 92. I sold drugs in 92, 3, 4, 5, 6. I'm like, man, I want some drugs for the five years that I was free. I wanted drugs every day, but I still couldn't do it because I had found out that God had more power than the enemy. So here it is. I'm going to wind it up like this. I got excited right there when I said that because I didn't understand it myself how I could just have drugs in my hand because I was the tester. I always tested my drugs so I made sure I had the right thing for the people. I was getting high on my own supply, I guess I would just say it like that. <laughs> Amen. And I was my best customer. 
<laughs> Amen. A lot of wear and tear. This is just a remaining. I'm just glad to have this is a portion left that I have right now. But I want you to get with this right here. Now that I gave up the most important thing, which was trust in me, I found out in his word, in Proverbs chapter 28, verse 26, he said, He that trusted in his own heart is a fool, but whosoever walk wisely shall be delivered. So I became wise and I got delivered. So in 1997, I stopped selling drugs. Amen. Now I want you to get with this right here. Most importantly, the reason why it says this in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, he says, if anyone desire to come after me, he said, the first thing you have to do is deny mm. <laughs> yourself. Come that on. was a big thing for me mm. because I've always trusted in me. And I was a fool, but I still trusted in me mm. because I didn't know God. Deny myself, take up my cross, which was that heavy stuff I was dealing with. He said, and daily. I just got excited. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Come on. He said, and daily, mm. follow me. Mm. So before he delivered me, when I turned my life over to him, I was on 16th and Joe Johnson doing my thing. And I heard a voice. I didn't know nothing about Paul, David, and all them cats in the Bible. I just know that I heard a voice tell me to go to church. And I'm thinking, I said, wait a minute, I'm out here amongst all the people that I'm used to being around, selling and using, and you telling me to go to church. I don't do church. <laughs> and so I continued. I wasn't tripping because I didn't do no trip. I nodded. I was on heroin. I didn't do no tripping, looking down <laughs> on the floor and all that old stuff. <laughs> I was cool, I thought. So all through the time, 1 o'clock in the morning coming, 2 in the morning, 3 in the morning coming, and I still hear this same voice talking about go to church. I'm like, it's sad tonight. I'm thinking about it. I know Lionel Richard say I'm easy like Sunday morning, but I don't go to no church. <laughs> Four or five o'clock in the morning come, now it's daylight didn't came. So I kept hearing that voice. So I went on home, freshened up, put me on a suit and went to church. Mm. Went into church and sitting in the very back in a strange place. I said, yeah, I'm in the church. I done came in the church full of dope and got dope with me and everything. They say, come as you are, so here I am. That's what I'm thinking. <laughs> the biggest thing I had to give up was trusting me. So now that I'm in here, and all of you all sitting like you are now, so you know, doing your thing, I say, well, let me go to the bathroom, because I got to go in the bathroom for a minute. And I went in there to the bathroom, pulled out my pack, done me some drugs, and went back in there and sat down. And I kept showing up. And I kept showing up. So I used to hear people in the church talking about just a little talk with Jesus would make everything all right. And I wasn't talking to him then. So I'd been going to the church for about six months. I was tired. I was, felt I was disrespecting God. So I went in the bathroom this time. I'm getting ready to wind it down. I went in the bathroom, pulled out my pack, opened it up, and I decided to talk to him. I said, God, I said, I'm tired of coming up in this church disrespecting you. And I heard that same voice that I heard when I was on the street say, go to church, tell me you're in the right place. Mm -hmm. When he said you was in the right place, I went on and snorted that drug and, and went right on back in there and sit down. How many of you know he may not come when you want him to, but he's always on time. When I denied myself, he gave me strength because I got out of the way. When I picked up that heavy stuff and followed him, I kept, kept snorting and following him. Snorting and following him. Snorting and following him. How many of you know I kept following him then in January the 31st, 1992. I went to him in 90. Took a little time, but guess what? He showed up. Mm. And it wasn't on no Sunday morning. It was on a Friday night when I was out there partying down. I've been delivered now for 21 years, so I'm going to celebrate every day. <laughs> and that's what I had to give up. Wow. That's what I had to give up. Amen. Trusting myself. Mm. Amen. Mr. Kinzer, do I need to read the question again? No, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> I know you don't. I'll keep this short. Um, I don't know if y'all you hear, but the thing that the world approved of that God didn't for me, and you and you heard the theme here, you all, it was is selfishness. The world approves of selfishness. We've come in more and more. I mean, into a, you know every man for himself. There's people who don't even know the neighbor down the street or more or less next door. 
because everybody about self. You know, it's like the more cars you get, you know, the big, you know, the more cars, more house, more bling bling, the more people want to be like that. And then they want a big car. They want a big house. They want a woman with a big butt. It's selfishness, you all. And that is the one thing the world, even nowadays, you know, uh, it's, we're in this I got you type world. Every watch TMZ, they're trying to find stuff for people. And you got people that code. They, we got to go from this world of I got you to we got you. And the thing about selflessness, y'all, and you hear it through here and you know yourself. Everybody in here that reads the word, that knows the word, and still goes out and do the things we do. It all comes down to one thing, selflessness, because we want to do what we want to do. That's why you got to find your identity in God. And a lot of people talk about it, but a lot of people don't know how to find that identity. And if you go to Galatians 5.22, it tells you how to walk in the fruits of the Spirit. There's only nine fruits of the Spirit. There's men derivatives of this. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, meekness, faith, and temperament, self-control. So I was ministering to this young lady, and she said, um, I was telling her, you know, you, you, you got to let go. You're trying to take control. You got to give it to God. And we've all been through this little thing like, okay, she came back to me and said, well, how do I know when God is in control or when I'm in trying to be in control? And it goes back to Galatians 5, 22, the fruits of the Spirit. If you are in that, if you follow those nine things, you are in divine order. You only need a book. You only need street signs because it will divinely order your steps. So how do you know if you're doing anything? If you're depressed, stressed, that's you trying to take control. That should be the first alarm. Oh, Lord, okay, that's me again. I'm talking even down to anxieties. That's not one of the fruits of the Spirit. And that's how you can understand when it's being, you're being selfless and self-indulgence because that lower ego kicks in of all those negative things of envy, you know, depression. Those are not fruits of the Spirit. That should tell you immediately if you're in that realm that's you trying to take control because we'll always mess it up. But if it's God in control, you will have peace in the storm. You know what I'm saying? You will have patience in the belly of the well. So it's that selfless, selfishness, you all, that separates us from God. And that's what the world approves of. And that's what God did to me. He stripped me down of all of those worldly things that promoted selfishness. And then I was able to see him. And you will too. And if you don't see him, it's because you got to strip yourself of those worldly, fleshly things that create that selflessness. That's good. That's good. That's good. Our last question. Our last question, if you would, hold it to uh, about a minute. You guys will have to respond in a minute for this last one. Uh, and, uh, and it's really centered on where do we go from here? Uh, many times you see conferences and men, they say, you know, it's like they talk a good game uh, publicly, but privately they live a total different life. And the, obviously the goal here is for us to go beyond the veil and to really be transparent and be men of power.